Thank you, worship team. Good morning. It's good to see everybody this morning. I want to welcome you to our service. Those of you who are worshiping with us online this morning, thanks for for being here with us. I just want to remind our online folks every now and then I do this, just remind you if, if there's a glitch, we had a glitch a couple of weeks ago where our internet was completely down. If that happens, if you would just jump over <clears throat> to our Facebook page, we'll do our best to, to get at least a message up on Facebook just to let you know what's going on and whether it's fixable or if we're just going to have to upload it later. Just want to remind you of that. But welcome. It's great to have you. It's great to have everybody here who's in the blue seats with us in person today. Uh, and if you're a first-time guest or maybe you've been a guest for a little while uh, checking us out, just want to welcome you uh, to our service this morning. Thank you. For being here. There is a connection card in the seat pocket in front of you if you're a first-time guest or maybe you haven't filled one of those out if you've been coming for a little while. We just love to connect a name uh, with the face. So if you want to connect with us that way, you can fill that out. Give us as much or as little info as you want to. There's an offering box in the back on your way out. You can drop that in there. Uh, if you're online, we've got an online version of that. You can just <clears throat> click the link there and it'll take you to that. But it's great to, to be worshiping together this morning. Let's go to God in prayer. God, we just thank you for this day. <clears throat> we just thank you for just an opportunity to come and just to, just to worship you jointly together, corporately as a church. And we just pray you would bless everything that is said and done and, <clears throat> and sung here today. And God, we just lift up everyone who's here, uh, those who are just celebrating things in their life because things are just going so well, and then others who are having some struggles in their lives. Uh, we just lift everyone up and just pray you would meet each and every one of us where we are. In Christ's name I pray. Amen. So a couple announcements before we jump into our, our new series this morning. But first of all, small groups launched this past week. I think most of them got off. Some of ours are waiting till this coming week uh, to launch. So it's not too late to connect with one of our small groups. So if you want to do that, uh, it, the easiest way to do that is just to click on the QR code that's in front of you. If you've got a smartphone with your camera, if you know how to do that, and that'll take you to our link, link tree, and you can just click small groups, and it'll take you. It'll give you a description of each of our small groups. Uh, take you to the sign up. <clears throat> All of them still have a little bit of space in them, so we'd love to have you connect with, with one of our, our small groups. And Grief Share starts tonight. I know this says the 4th, but it's actually a typo in our graphic. Uh, it's tonight at 5.30 or 5 o'clock. 5. Uh, and Ellie, would you just stand up quickly? Don't want to embarrass you, but Ellie is leading our Grief Share. I just want you to see her face because if you hadn't had a chance to, to ask questions about this or find out more or sign up if you want to and you're like, how do I do that? Ellie can help you with that. I can help you with that uh, right after the service. Uh, and I want to say this about Grief Share. It's, it's structured in a way that you can jump in anytime you want to. You can jump in and out of Grief Share anytime you want to. It's topical. Each week is a different subject, so they're not necessarily connected to each other. So if, if you feel like you, you, know, you, you just need this particular area of, of support in this particular topic, you can go right to the, to the page and it'll show you all the different topics that'll be coming up over the 13, 13 weeks, right? Um, so so that's, that's something unique about it. It's a little bit different than our other small groups is that it's kind of you can jump in and out of if you need to. So even if you don't start with them tonight, but you want to start later, uh, or if your schedule uh, doesn't allow you to start tonight or next week, you can always jump in Grief Share anytime you want to. And we do plan on running this a couple of times a year. Uh, we wanted to get our feet wet. This is our first, first go with it. Um, and we're talking about opening it up to the community as a, as a, as a resource for folks in our community, not just in our church, uh, too, as we, as we launch this down the road as well. So, so check that out if, if that's something you, you need. Um, with that said, we are starting a brand new series uh, this week that we're going to be in for the next six weeks. We'll finish it up on Easter Sunday morning. I'm excited about this series um, for a few reasons. One is I'm not the only one teaching. Lex is going to be teaching as a part of this series. One sermon. I'm going to be out of town in a couple of weeks. Um, we're also right now, we haven't worked out the logistics, but we've invited some of the folks from one of the organizations that we started working with, with um, some of our um, refugee support in the area to come and speak to us about that work and, and some of the next steps we're looking at as a church for getting involved with that. Uh, it, it, it flows right into what we're going to be talking about with, with, this, uh, with this series. So I'm excited about, about this series. And what we're going to be doing in this series is looking at some of the things that Jesus said as we kind of head towards Easter, as Jesus sort of, sort of headed towards uh, that Last Supper and, and towards Easter. Um, it, it, we, we call them the red letters sometimes, which is where the, the title comes from. Because some of you may have a, a Bible, especially if you have a printed Bible, that is called a red letter edition, right? Uh, and a red letter edition of the Bible is simply in the, in the New Testament, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, they put the words of Jesus in red. So they kind of stand out, and you know, this is, 
This is actually Jesus speaking here. They're quoting Jesus. So that's, that's where the, the title comes from. So we're going to look at them, some of the things that Jesus said and some of the people that he encountered uh, for the next six weeks. And, and the words of Jesus aren't always what we think of when we think of the words of Jesus. Because the, the words of Jesus sometimes are, are comforting, but sometimes they're kind of jarring. And, and sometimes they're encouraging, and at other times they're very, very challenging. At, at times, uh, Jesus' words are gentle, and then sometimes they can seem just really, really harsh. And so we're going to spend the next six weeks looking at some of these red letters, some of these words of Jesus and the people that, that he encountered who were just struggling to understand how, how do I be a follower of Jesus? And, and how does that relate to us as, as we struggle with how do we follow Jesus? So today, we're going to look at a guy in Luke chapter 10. So if you've got a Bible and you want to flip to that, if you've got a phone or an iPad, and open that up. If you're online, you can go to any of those online resources. If you don't have any of that, don't worry, we'll put everything up on the screen for you this morning. But we're looking at this guy in Luke 10, and he was a lawyer. And the fact that he was a lawyer also meant he was a religious leader because their law was completely connected to the Scriptures, the first five books of the Bible. And, and this lawyer, his issue that he's trying is, is, is basically that, that he's trying to place some conditions on his love. He, he, he's trying to, to place some condition on the love that he shows other people. He's trying to actually limit who he loves and who he shows love to. And just like a good lawyer, he's looking for some loopholes in the law, right? So, so here's what Luke tells us happens. It says, On one occasion, an expert in the law stood up to test Jesus. Teacher, he asked, what must I do to inherit inter- eternal life? And, and, and when he asked that question, he was basically asking Jesus, Jesus, what is the minimum? What is the minimum requirement to get into heaven? What, what is the, what's the minimum requirement for me to stay on God's good side? And, and that's just, that's not, doesn't make him a bad person. It just makes him human, right? I mean, at some point, we've probably all done that, or we've known some people who have done that. You know, what do I have to do to make sure I'm good with God and God is good with me? Kind of a typical human thing. And Jesus answers this guy's question by, by asking a question, which was very, very typical in those days. This was typical within the Jewish culture that Jesus lived in, that, that rabbis, this is just how rabbis taught, is, is students would ask a question and the question would, the, stu- the rabbi would turn around and, and ask the student a question related to their question to get them talking and to get them thinking and to get them dialoguing uh, about that. So there was this back and forth. So what Jesus is doing here is very, very typical. He's not trying to avoid the question. And here's, here, here's what Jesus asked him. He says, well, what is written in the law? Jesus asked, I mean, how do you read it? Which is a really natural question to ask someone who's an expert in the law, right? I mean, he's asking Jesus, what does the law require of me in order for me to stay on God's good side? And Jesus says, well, you're the expert in the law. You tell me. You're the one that studied this. You know this. You're an expert in the law. You tell me, how do you read the law? And, and the experts in the, in the law in those days, they had basically, what they had done is they had summarized all of the laws. Because in the Old Testament, there were hundreds and hundreds of laws, hundreds of them, and, and just tons of laws. And so the experts of the law, they, they had basically summarized all of those hundreds of laws into two main laws that were basically a combination of two Old Testament scriptures, Deuteronomy 6.5 and Leviticus 19, verse 18. You can look those up on your own sometime if you want to, but, but one of them, one of those verses, they talk about loving God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. And the other verse talks about loving your neighbor. And, and so the lawyer, he answers Jesus' question by giving him basically the same answer that most experts in the law would have given Jesus. He says this, love the Lord your God with all your heart, and with all your soul, and with all your strength, and with all your mind, and love your neighbor as yourself. Those are those two Old Testament passages combined, boiled down the law. And, and Jesus answered him, you have answered correctly. Do this and you will live. Now, the lawyer at this point is faced with a, with a dilemma. Because even if, you, even if you summarize these hundreds and hundreds of Old Testament laws down to these two kind of 
big laws of, of love God and, and love your neighbor, it's still a pretty large order, especially the love your neighbor part. And, and for this guy, loving your neighbor just can't mean loving everyone because, because there's clearly some people in this guy's life that he doesn't want to love. This guy doesn't want to, to love. Uh, there are some people that, that he doesn't maybe, maybe doesn't think deserve his love. So, so there has to be some limitations to this. Like I said, he's trying to figure out what's the minimum I can do and what are the loopholes in the law. So he asked Jesus kind of a follow-up question, and this is his follow-up question. He asked, but he wanted to justify himself. So he asked Jesus, and who is my neighbor? And, and, and Jesus, Jesus, who is my neighbor? Who do I have to love? You know, if, if I want to if I want to follow God, if I want to be good with God and God good with me, who do I have to love? And, and like so he, he so often does, Jesus, Jesus answers this question with a story, which again was very typical in this culture. And here's the story Jesus tells. <clears throat> a man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho when he was attacked by robbers. And they stripped him of his clothes, beat him, and went away, leaving him half dead. A priest happened to be going down the same road, and when he saw the man, he passed by on the other side. So too a Levite, when he came to the place and saw him, pass by the other side. But a Samaritan, as he traveled, came to where the man was. And when he saw him, he took pity on him. He, he went to him, and he bandaged his wounds, poured on oil and wine, and then put, him, put the man on his donkey, brought him to an inn, and took care of him. And the next day, he took out two denarii and gave them to the innkeeper. And here's what he said, Look after him, and I will, when I return, I will reimburse you for any extra expense that you may have. So, what does this story that Jesus told teach us about being followers of Jesus? What does it, what does it teach us about living out the gospel, the good news? Of Jesus, because that's what we're called to do. What does it teach us? Uh, not about just proclaiming the good news of Jesus, but, but actually living out the good news of Jesus. First, I think it's, it's teaching us this, that, that following Jesus, living out the gospel, is incredibly practical. It's just incredibly practical. When the Samaritan finds this guy on the side of the road, he doesn't do anything, at least on the surface, at least that we're told in the story, he doesn't do anything that looks spiritual, Right? I mean, think about it. He, he doesn't pray for this guy. He doesn't lay hands on this guy other than to bandage him up. He, he doesn't read scripture to this guy. He doesn't sing a hymn to these guys. He, he's, just, he's just meeting this guy's very, very practical needs. His physical needs, his medical needs, his emotional needs, his, his, his transportation needs, his, his housing needs, all of that, just all of these practical needs that this that this guy has. And that's just true, that, that, that most of the time when we're living out the gospel in our lives, that the most spiritual things that you will do won't really look very spiritual. But even though they don't look spiritual, they are incredibly, incredibly important. There are these incredibly practical things that are done in response to the needs that we just see around us. And they're incredibly important because of this, that the gospel that we proclaim is validated by the gospel that we live. Let me, let me say that one more time. The gospel that we proclaim, that we say we believe, is validated in the way we live, by the gospel that we live. The second thing is this, living out the gospel crosses boundaries. Now, we've talked about this a lot. We did an entire series last year on Acts where we talked about how the the new church, the church in Jerusalem that was formed in the first century, how it crossed all kinds of boundaries, uh, all kinds of, of cultural boundaries and racial boundaries and, and all of that. But it, it's not a coincidence, I don't think, that, that Jesus chooses a Samaritan and a Jew to be the two main characters in this story. Because remember, Jesus is telling this story for a reason. There's a purpose behind it. So, so everything he's telling in, the story, in this story is because Jesus is wanting to make a point with the story. When, I mean, whenever you read a story in the Bible, especially whenever you read a story told by Jesus, it's always a good idea to ask, why are those characters in the story? Why are those characters in the story? And why are those characters placed in the story the way that they're placed in the story? So it's not a coincidence that Jesus chooses a Samaritan and a Jew to be the two main characters in the story because they hated each other. These two groups of people hate each other. They had a long, long history 
of, of hating each other. I mean, they even went so far as to avoid walking through each other's territories. Even if the shortest distance between where they needed to go was through the other one's territory, they would walk all the way around it just to avoid seeing them and potentially bumping into them. They just, they just hated so they, they, each other. There was this, such bad history between these two groups. And for this Samaritan, for this Samaritan to help this Jew who had been robbed, who had been beaten, who had left, been left for dead on the side of the road, it would have required him to cross all sorts of rach, racial and religious and historical boundaries. And, and it's a reminder to us that that's just what love does, that, that love crosses all kinds of boundaries. As, 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 and as followers of Jesus, you and I, you are called to love people who look different than you. You're called to love people who have a different world view than you, who, who come from a different religion than you. You're called to love people who behave different than you. You're called to people, love people who vote differently than you. And, and, and it, doesn't, it doesn't mean right up here that, that we endorse everything that we love, right? It doesn't mean that we, we endorse everything we love because God's love extends infinitely beyond what he endorses, Right? God's love extends infinitely beyond what he endorses. God, God's love has no end. God, God's love and grace and compassion, it, it's not limited or it's not conditioned on anything. And if we're committed to living out the gospel, if we're serious about not just proclaiming the gospel, but actually living it out, it, then we will show that same kind of unconditional love and compassion in our own lives to the people around us. So the gospel is incredibly practical. Uh, and, and living out the gospel it crosses all of these boundaries. And then third, living out the gospel is risky. Again, Jesus puts these characters in the story, and he puts, them, he puts them on a particularly dangerous part of this road between Jerusalem and Jericho. And as he's telling this story, he's probably envisioning, or the people that are hearing this story were probably envisioning a place called, that was called the, the Pass of Blood. Uh, and, and, and the reason it was called the Pass of Blood is because this particular stretch of road, it contained these hills that had lots of caves in them. And so they were just great places for people to hide out. And, and, and they would jump out and they would, they would rob people. And so as a result of that, lots of people got robbed along this way. They got beaten. Many of them even got, even got killed on this dangerous stretch of road called the Pass of Blood. Now, when the priest and the Levite came by... Uh, this dangerous stretch of road, and they see this man that's been, he's been beaten up, he's laying here, he's been left, he's been left for dead. We're told in a story that they quickly cross the road and keep going, right? They pass by on the other side. Now, do you know why they did that? Do you know why they quickly crossed the road, passed by, and kept going? Because they're not stupid. <laughs> that's why they did that. Because they're, they're not dumb. They, they know this guy has just been beaten up. He's been robbed. He's been left on the side of the road. He's bloodied and all of that. And there's a pretty good chance that the people who did that to him might still be waiting, just waiting for somebody dumb enough to go over and help him so they can jump out and rob them as well. So when the Samaritan stops and helps this guy, he is risking everything. And when he takes this guy that, that he doesn't even know, and, and, and it's not even connected to religiously or culturally. In fact, there's bad blood between the two sides. When he takes this guy to an inn and, and he says, and I'll pay for it. I'll cover it. I'll take care of all the expenses that he has while this guy recovers here. He's willing not only to, to take a risk, but he's willing to sacrifice something as well. Now, what would motivate him to do that? We're going to get to that in, in just a minute, but before we do that, Jesus wants us to know what doesn't motivate this guy. Jesus wants to make sure we know what doesn't motivate this Samaritan. And what's not motivating him is a sense of obligation or feelings of guilt. Again, it's no coincidence that the two people that Jesus puts on this road, who, who, who are the first ones to find this guy, are a Levite and a priest. Religious leaders, right? Right? I mean, they, they would have been viewed, these two men as religious leaders, they would have been viewed as the most moral and the most compassionate people in the culture. In, in fact, part of their job as a Levite 
and as a priest was to, dis to distribute the alms, to distribute the, the offerings that were taken, that were to be given to people who were actually in need, people who, who were on the fringes of culture, who were marginalized or who were poor or who just had a financial need. Their jobs, their profession was to be compassionate. I mean, they were, they were paid to be compassionate. They were, they were paid to show compassion to those people who were hurting and who, who needed, needed help. That's what their vocation was. And because of that, if anyone was going to feel some sort of sense of obligation or, or duty to help this guy, it would have been these two men walking by. And they didn't do that. They, I mean, if they, and if they didn't help this man out of their, their sense of duty and obligation, these two guys, they would have felt a huge sense of, of guilt and even a sense of shame for not living out their vocation. So by putting these two guys in the story and having them not be willing to stop and help this guy, Jesus is reminding us that, that when it comes to living out the gospel and being willing to risk and being willing to sacrifice, that moral obligation and guilt will only take you so far. Moral obligation will, will get you to do some things, like, like when it's not that difficult and it, it's not that risky and it doesn't require that much sacrifice or you can afford it. You know, moral obligation, a sense of duty, it'll get you there for that. And, and guilt uh, will get you there. I mean, guilt works, right? I mean, at, at some level, guilt works. Guilt can kind of get you to do things that, that aren't too risky, that aren't too difficult, that aren't, don't require too much sacrifice. Uh, guilt can, you can guilt someone into doing that kind of stuff. But what Jesus is reminding us of is that moral obligation and duty and guilt will only take you so far. It won't be enough uh, when, when there's real risk and, and when there's real costliness involved. The story that Jesus is teaching us is that the moral obligation won't take you to where Jesus wants you to go. It, guilt won't take you to where Jesus wants you to go. It, we have to be motivated by something else. We have to be motivated by something more, which leads us to the next thing that, that Jesus is teaching us with this story, which is that living out the gospel begins with receiving the gospel. It, it, it's really hard to live out the gospel unless you've actually received the gospel. Now, if Jesus was trying to guilt this lawyer here into just loving a little bit more, he would have told the story in a completely different way. He, he, he would have had made the, the hero of the story very similar to the lawyer. And he, would have, he would have placed the Samaritan, the horrible, hated Samaritan who's done all of these evil things to the Jewish people, right? He, he, would, have, he would have placed the Samaritan on the side of the road, bloodied and beaten up and left for dead. And when the hero of the story shows compassion to this poor, wounded Samaritan, Jesus would have said to this lawyer, you need to show that same kind of, of love to the same poor uh, Samaritans in your life? Who are the people in your life that are hard to love and hard to extend grace to? Who are those poor, wounded Samaritans? You need to show love even to those people in your life. But that's not what Jesus tells, that's not the way Jesus tells the story. Jesus makes the Samaritan the hero of the story, and he puts someone like the lawyer on the side of the road and left for dead. And then Jesus flips the question that the lawyer asks. The question that the lawyer asked was, you know, who is my neighbor? Jesus, who do I have to love? And, and, and it, it just makes the lawyer just like us, right? Because we do this too. I mean, when we talk about following Jesus and we talk about showing unconditional love uh, to people, we tend to go, at least in our heads, and sometimes people will have a conversation with me, but typically it's just in our heads, that, that, that it basically goes like this, yeah, but, yeah, but let, me, let me give you some details about this person. Right? Am I really supposed to love them? Because let me, let me tell you what they did. Let me tell you how they acted. Let me tell you who they are. Right? And, we're, and we're like, are you talking about that person? And that's what, that's what the lawyer is asking. And he's saying, Jesus, I, I know that I need to expand my love a little bit, but who can I exclude from that love? Who's my neighbor? And Jesus flips the question, and here's how Jesus flips the question. Which of these three, he asked the lawyer, which of these three do you think was a neighbor to the man who fell into the hands of robbers? And the expert of the law replied, the one who had mercy on him. And Jesus said, go and do likewise. In other words, 
Jesus is saying the question is not who do I have to love. That's the wrong question. The question is if, if I was the one who was beaten up, if I was the one who was bloodied and left on the side of the road, who would I want to love me? That's the question. And the reason Jesus says that is the right question is because the only thing that will motivate you to show unconditional love, even when it's costly, even when it's risky, even when it requires sacrifice, the only thing that will motivate you to show unconditional love is when you've been on the receiving end of unconditional love, which is at the core of the message of the gospel, isn't it? The message of the gospel is, is not only that that Jesus came into this world, this broken and sinful world, but that he came to the road where we were. He came to the road where we were wounded and broken, and like the Samaritan, Jesus risked everything. He gave up everything. He sacrificed everything to love us and to have compassion on us and to show mercy to us and make us whole again. And, and when you've been loved like that, it sets you free to love others in the same way. And, and until you've been loved by, like that, until you, until you walk in that love that you have received, until you, you are daily embracing the, the fact that, that you were the one on the side of the road, that there is someone who came along and loved you so much, who showed you so much compassion to you, only when you have, have, have known that and received that kind of love and you are living in the reality of that kind of love can you show that kind of love to others. And we're going to pick it up right there next week. So don't miss next week as we continue to look at the red letters, at the words of Jesus. Let me pray for you. Heavenly Father, Lord, just like this question that this lawyer asked Jesus, we all ask the same question of, of who do we have to love? And, and it's just that we're looking for loopholes to get out of loving the people that you've called us to. But God, the bigger question is, have we, have we truly experienced, have we truly embraced your unconditional love in our lives? Have we truly experienced that? And are we living that out and reminding ourselves that we're living that out on a daily basis so that we can in turn give that unconditional love to others? So God, as we, as we look into this series over the next six weeks, just open our hearts and open our minds to what you want us to hear from your own words, from your own mouth, through the red letters. And may it change us. May it move us to be more compassionate people. May it move us to embrace you for who you are in our lives. May it move us to be the people that you've called us to be as your followers. In Christ's name I pray. Amen. Hey, we're going to stand and sing one more song to head out. I hope you have a great week wherever you find yourself this week. I want to thank you for being here. Don't forget, small groups are, are, are happening. It's not too late to jump in. Uh, grief share starts tonight. We'd love to have you participate in that if that's something you need in your life right now. Um, let's stand and sing one more time.